So I'd like to welcome everybody to um, the final uh, webinar in our series on uh, teaching online. Uh, the topic today is Effective Practices for Teaching Online. My name is Sam Anneman in the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I'll be your host today. So just a few quick items here. Uh, if you have any sound problems, uh -huh, <laughs> hopefully not, uh, but you know, uh, check your, your voice using the audio. If uh, you need any help during the session, um, please call WebEx support at 866-229-3239. And if you temporarily need to leave the session, if you could just click the little coffee cup from the emoticons drop-down menu, that will let us know that you um, left, but you are coming back. And then finally, just a, a few uh, guidelines. So if you have any uh, questions, please raise your hand if you want to ask them via the microphone. Feel free at any time to type comments or questions into the chat. I will be monitoring it. Uh, we are recording a session, and I will be sending the link to you uh, later this week. And I know that our, our presenter today will pause every few minutes also get to give you the opportunity to ask any questions you have. Uh, so right now, I would just like to introduce uh, Florence Martin from Insystem, Instructional Systems Technology, uh, and she'll be speaking today about enhancing interaction in your online courses. So please welcome Florence Martin. Thank you, Sam. Um, and I'm sorry about the tech uh, technology challenges. You know, it's part of teaching, so you're probably all familiar with it. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll be mindful of the time that we have, and you know, we should uh, definitely be able to get done within the allotted time. I wanted to clarify, so the title for today's presentation is Enhancing Interaction in Your Online Courses. Okay, so you should be able to see it in full screen now. Okay, perfect. Um, so a little bit more about me, um, if you've not had a chance to attend one of my webinars, um, I've been leading the series on teaching online uh, for uh, CTL the last couple of years, and this is the last one of the series. Um, I teach an instructional systems technology program uh, here in the College of Education, and I research on online learning environments too primarily asynchronous uh, online learning right now. Um, and I teach, uh, you know, uh, courses on, one of the courses I teach is design, development, and evaluation of online learning. I also teach a course on instructional multimedia development. Uh, so uh, this is the program that I'm part of. Um, and we have three concentrations. We actually have a concentration in online learning and teaching where students can earn a graduate certificate or uh, a master's in uh, education. So uh, there's quite a bit of research that's been done on interaction. You know, as online instructors, um, we all know that interaction is essential. Actually, you know, before I uh, get into that, um, if you don't mind, can you quickly tell me um, uh, what program you are from and also uh, what interests you in this webinar? Do you teach online? Are you getting ready to teach online? So you can type in the chat window. You know, um, I would love to know um, just a little bit about your background, okay? What program you're part of and if you are already teaching online or if you are interested in teaching online in the coming semesters or if you teach blended too. Because a lot of the strategies we're going to talk about today about enhancing interaction will work for the blended setting as well, okay? I'm kind of monitoring the chat. Okay, great. I'll give you a minute to talk or to type, okay? So several of them I see, oh, teaching online in summer, blended in future, respiratory therapy, yes, all online, school of nursing, all online, three success, okay, and uh, and says moving, getting ready to teach uh, research 6101, okay, from hybrid to online, Elizabeth, uh, okay, she's a doctoral uh, student, and develop online courses, okay, great, we'll do blended in the future. Okay, excellent. Uh, good to good to you know know that you're all interested in teaching online or doing some kind of online teaching right now. So um, we know that you know in an online course uh, interaction is critical and it is crucial to student satisfaction and engagement. Um, 
So that's what research has found, and it enhances the effectiveness of any distance education course, right? Compared to a self-paced course, the, the students have to do it by themselves without any interaction. Um, it doesn't mean that more interaction doesn't mean it's going to be always better. So, you know, a balance is, is essential, and also it's essential for active participation. So one of my biggest concerns, you know, when I started teaching asynchronously online, so um, I've, I've been teaching asynchronously online for three years. So before that, for seven years, I taught synchronously online, you know, so WebEx was my primary mode. So when I made the switch, um, initially I was a little um, nervous. You know, how do I get to know my students? How do I build relationships? So those are all questions you have, right, when you don't meet them anymore um, face to face. But surprisingly, you can do quite a bit of, you know, establishing relationships and building a sense of community and uh, building those connections even in an online setting. And interaction is very critical to that. Um, so here are a couple of different definitions on interaction. Um, so I, I want to give you a little bit of theory and then, you know, we spend the rest of the time talking about strategies. Um, Daniel and Marcus, they define interaction as an activity in which a student is in two-way contact with one or more persons. So, you know, it could be another student, it could be the instructor. So, just uh, where a student is in two-way contact. And Gilbert and Moore, they define interactivity in a computer-mediated instruction as it's a reciprocal exchange between the technology and the learner. So, here the technology comes into play. Um, here's a definition from Wagner, um, who uh, defined instructional intervention as an event that takes place between a learner and the learner's environment. And its purpose is to respond to the learner in a way intended to change his or her behavior toward an educational goal. So here's a little bit more to the definition, right? So there is a change that happens as a result of this interaction. And I think, you know, uh, that is critical. Um, Moving on. Okay, so this is the framework I want to leave you with. So, you know, if you don't remember the other definitions, it's okay. This is a very well-known uh, framework that's used when we talk about def uh, interaction. And it's, you know, it's dated in the 90s. There's still a lot of research that's being done around this. So three types of interaction that's um, essential in any online uh, course. It's a learner-learner interaction, learner-instructor interaction, and learner-content in uh, interaction. And some researchers have even gone ahead and added a fourth type which is the learner technology interaction. But we'll focus on these three um, types of interaction. So learner-learner is very valuable, um, you know, so it, it is important for the students to be part of the community, get to know their peers. Otherwise, you know, they're going to feel isolated. So you don't want that happening. And same way, it is highly desirable, you know, for them to have the learner-instructor interaction. Um, which helps them maintain, you know, uh, uh, the connection. They have that interest uh, when, when they get to know the um, instructor. And then um, uh, finally, learner content interaction. So this is the part where they intellectually engage with the content. So that is very important too. So uh, here are some strategies. So how do you establish learner-learner interaction? And you know, you probably do a lot of these strategies. So these are some that I do, I'm going to share, but I would love to hear from you too. So there's a strategy that may, what I'll do is I'll pause at the end of each section, and if the strategy that you use, I would like to hear from you, okay? So that we can all learn from each other. So what are some ways I try to build learner-learner interaction? I set up a student lounge. You know, in the online course, it's just a discussion forum. And um, it is not content related. It's like a student, a, for, a forum where students can discuss any topic and meet informally to, you know, exchange uh, common interests. Um, a lot of times, you know, they don't use it. Sometimes they do. So it's always nice to give them that opportunity. You know, they know that you have access to watch or see what we're discussing so that that part is always there but then you know giving them the room for them to you know go ahead and uh, uh, just talk to each other you know uh, that is nice um, an icebreaker discussion you know just like in a face-to-face -face class um, you know it's very important for us to do a discussion uh, an introduction sorry icebreaker introduction discussion it's very important and I think most of you do it um, quality it's a quality matters um, standard requirement too and 
and um, so having a forum for them to introduce themselves and also respond to their peers. And here's something I do differently from a text-based interaction. I do a voice thread interaction, which is like a audio-video kind of a technology. So they're just not typing messages, but they are seeing and hearing from each other. So that kind of is really neat, right? So you get to know the other person a little better. So uh, that's another strategy that helps um, using like, you know, a different tool to do this interaction. Um, I have students sign up to be moderators when I do discussions. So the discussions are peer facilitated, but you know, I also teach at the graduate level. So where they're ready to take the responsibility to lead discussions and summarize it. And um, so it is it is uh, really helpful. And um, so they, they talk to each other, you know, so that learner-learner that -learner interaction really exists. And uh, peer review for projects, if you're not already doing that, so that's another way where uh, students are looking at each other's work, uh, they're displaying their work with their classmates, uh, they're motivating each other, so that's another way where learner-learner interaction can be enhanced. And then using some sessions like this, you know, like um, uh, using WebEx. Um, I try to do one in the middle of the semester, I call it a Q&A session, mid semester Q&A, but again, we all log in, we're all in, like connected in real time and also maybe one at the end of the semester if there are any presentations so they get to talk to each other too right to so chat or you know they can pick up the microphone and talk so um, that's another way to um, enhance that I have just screenshots of each of these interactions I talked about so there's the student lounge you know so just like a discussion forum that's how I do it um, the icebreaker introduction introduction I talked about voice thread uh, if any of you want to take a look at it it's voicethread.com you can just go and you know what I do is I model it too. I do my introduction on VoiceThread as well, and then they get to do the art. Um, and this is the one, you know, again, I make them sign up to be a forum moderator. I give them instructions on, you know, what all do you need to be able to do as a moderator. So that's what the bulleted points are. Um, like, you know, main, like be uh, encourage discussion, you know, maybe open-ended. Uh, and then you have to, like, summarize at the end of the week. And they get to pick which discussion they want to facilitate. So it's kind of a little bit more, you know, based on interest. Um, this is peer reviewing, you know, you have peer reviewing opportunity. So those are just briefly, I think I had about five different strategies of learner-learner interaction. Um, so this is a good time to take some questions or also hear from you if you use any other strategies. Do any of you use any other strategies on learner-learner interaction? Okay, you can type in the chat window. You don't have to pick up the microphone if you don't want to. But I would love to hear, um, do you do like group projects? Those are one way, you know, though challenging in an online setting, a group project definitely enhances learner-learner uh, interaction. Okay, I don't, I'm not seeing any um, uh, chat messages. So I'm gonna assume uh, that I should keep moving forward. So the next one is learner instructor, and this is very, very important, right? Um, as much as learner-learner interaction is important, so for them to be able to talk to us, they want to know that we are there for them, that we are real, you know, so those are some important uh, strategies. And um, annotate, okay, I'm not using any of the tools. Um, Oh, I can use this. Okay. So, um, like in synchronous session, you want to, um, oh, in synchronous session, you, you, you want to uh, do several of the synchronous session, and then you also want to be able to, like, you know, use, like use a variety of the features in the synchronous sessions that enhances interaction. You know, the chat messages are great, uh, using polling, using emoticons, um, the whiteboard, those are all great features to use to enhance learner-learner interaction. And then um, um, you want to, when you do discussions, using your name. You know, sometimes it's, it's a lot, lot of threads to read, but when you respond to students, it's important for you to uh, regularly address them by name uh, to promote engagement and attention. Sending regular announcements to the students. 
You know what I do is I send an uh, uh, announcement every Monday to hear from me. So when you go for a long period of time, like you know, the students don't hear from you, they, they begin to worry because they don't get to see you, right? So um, sending regular announcements is important. Uh, providing more than one way for the students to contact you, that's important. Uh, sh showing that you're available for them, you know. I use a forum called Contact the Instructor Forum and then they can pose general questions, but then they can also email or they can show up for my virtual office hours or they can call me. So knowing that, you know, there's a variety of ways they can contact is important. Uh, providing online office hours uh, is important. And um, here's the other one, and this is a quality matter standard and a very important one. They like for you in your syllabus to list your response time to the students, which means if a student emails you, how quickly are you going to get back to them? Um, Anne, are you, Anne has a question about what do you use for online office hours? Anne, I like WebEx. I like the meeting room in WebEx. If you have not used that, you know, different from the training room, the meeting room is a standard URL. Actually, if you look at one of my signatures, you know, in, the, in any email if you've received from me, um, it stays the same, so you can put it on your syllabus. And if a student logs in, you'll even get an email saying, somebody is waiting for you in your meeting room. So uh, that's my favorite. Uh, you know, I used to use Skype, but now simply move to WebEx, and it's the same room you can use over and over again. I also use it for advising. I use it for working with research collaborators, too. So um, that's a great tool, yes. OK, um, so I was talking about office hours or responding promptly. So in your syllabus, you know, posting, how quickly you get back to them? Um, you know, initially, I, I actually listed as 24 to 48 hours on weekdays. Um, and, you know, so, uh, but you should do what, whatever is comfortable for you. Um, so students know they cannot send you an email, like, you know, at 1 o'clock and expect a response at 1.10, uh, which a lot of students do. So, you know, uh, it's important to have that. And even a response time for grading, uh, having that in there too helps, and then keeping up with that time frame. Um, Providing students an opportunity to reflect at the end of each module. You know, I, I used to use the journal feature when I was in Moodle, and now in Canvas I just do it as an assignment. So ask them a couple of questions at the end of every module. What benefited you this week? What challenged you this week? And what? Um, how will you apply what you learned this week in your current or future job setting? And, um, you know, uh, that really, I enjoy reading the reflections in each module because that kind of helps you connect with them a little bit more. They talk about challenges. It's not directly content specific, you know. It's about what they got out of that week. And so I enjoy reading those. And also being able to provide feedback via different modalities so they know that, you know, you are, um, there is an instructor. And with reflection, you know, when students respond to you, you respond back to them too. It's time consuming, but then, then they, they know that, you know, my instructor is reading it and is ready to uh, respond back. And um, for feedback, I still do text-based and I do uh, visual-based, you know, I do I teach a lot of design and development. So um, I, I know that in Canvas you have these audio functionality now, audio videos if you want to record. That really shows, you know, uh, that it is that shows that the instructor is there and you know instructor reading and um, th that is helpful too. Okay, moving on. Um, so I have slides for each of those. Um, so this is the, the WebEx tool. This is actually the meeting room, um, and this is the one you asked. It's very similar to the training center, just a slight difference in the look and feel. Um, it is. Um, it doesn't have the breakout room option. So that's the uh, only thing, you know. But if you're doing a meeting, technically, you shouldn't have to be doing breakout room. Elizabeth says, uh, Canvas also has a meeting option for meeting online and holding office hours, but you can't easily access recording long time. OK. So is this when you click on conference, Elizabeth? It's probably the big blue button. Is that what it's taking you to? OK, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, the thing about can uh, the WebEx is, you know, it's the same link. You don't have to create it. I don't know. I think for big blue button, I think you have to create each time, I think. Um, OK. 
Uh, and here are the forums I talked about, you know, announcement forum. I have one titled announcement forum where they see an email from me. Actually, I post a message and, you know, generates an email too, right? And there's the contact the instructor forum. So general questions, I tell them to post it there. And then when they, when, uh, they post it, you respond, everybody sees it. So especially if you have large class sizes, you're kind of like, you know, uh, saving the time from responding to uh, individual emails. Virtual office hours use like a variety of other tools too. You know, you could even do Google Hangouts these days since we are now a Google campus. You know, we use Gmail. Uh, Skype is there, but you know, uh, there is WebEx. Uh, this is the reflection. Uh, oh, this is the feedback and reflection I was talking about. So these are the questions I asked. You know, the A, B, and C on this slide. What benefited you the most? What challenged you the most? And how do you see yourself applying what you learned this week in your current or future job setting? And then also collecting data periodically. You know, now the university is sending out midterm surveys. I've always been doing midterm surveys because, you know, you want to know uh, how the students are doing. And, you know, and all this type of communication, you know, uh, even though it's an instructional strategy, it enhances interaction too, right? Um, so you are asking them, they are giving you uh, responses, and then you are acting on it. So that is very important. Um, but, okay, so before we move on to the third category, any other strategies do you use for learner instructor interaction? Okay, not seeing any responses. I'm keeping track of time. Okay, so here are a few about content. Okay, this is the learner content. So, oh, okay, there's Elizabeth, she's addressed by students by name. Very good. I think it's very important. Yeah, sometimes they might think, you know, it's a little thing. How much of a difference can it make? I think, but if you are a student, I think, you know, it really makes a difference to them. Discussion, and I also try and do it when I grade, like, you know, when I put comments in the box, comment box, I try and address them by name, too. Um, so for content, you know, presenting content in more than one format, um, text, video, and audio, um, um, which is nice. Um, I use, uh, you know, I mean, book chapter readings, articles, but I also do instructor-generated, like, e-lessons, I do Camtasia recordings, so that helps. So even if I don't see my students, they see me, right? They recognize you and they feel that they know you. So th those are nice things. Um, games and simulations to keeping the students' uh, attention, uh, providing links to online resources which allow students to explore the topic in more depth. Sometimes you, know, you could give recommended um, material and then also optional material, additional um, resources they can explore, um, using audio and video clips for guest le lectures. So these are all interaction with the content. And then finally, even the synchronous sessions again. I think synchronous has come up in like all three categories. So synchronous, like you know, in, when you invite guests, like guest talks, guests like um, guests for doing talks and lectures, and also for student presentations. You know, they engage with content with each other. So those are some uh, ways to do it. Um, and guiding students to generating their own content. You know, so moving uh, higher in the uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy level where they are creating content. I think you know that's uh, helpful. Uh, being in an instructional technology program, we're always asking them to build something. You know, so. Uh, um, um, rather than write papers. Um, I mean, writing papers, it doesn't mean it's not important, but then, you know, um, also doing uh, other other levels of uh, activities, generating your own content. Um, requiring participation in discussion forums um, uh, where, you know, students reflect and build on content. Um, I make them do one every every week. My modules are every week, so. And then also doing self-test. You know, again, they are like working with, con like, you know, checking the understanding of content and keeping the co format of your lessons consistent. That's important, too. So I used to use a table-based format. Uh, this was in Moodle. I still do a table-based in Canvas, too, now. Uh, I've just gone into a linear, like a single um, column table now. Um, Whereas I did a different, uh, so every week, you know, they'll see something like this in my uh, course. So they know that, you know, uh, this is what I do uh, in terms of content work this particular week. There's objectives, readings and resources, e-lessons, and then for activities, they do a discussion with assignment and a reflection. 
Um, so I talked about, you know, when the talking about content of doing instructor generated material, you know, there's a lot of resources, external resources that, uh, resources that we might use, but it's also sometimes nice to have like a short clip from us, even though it takes time for us to record it, you know, uh, you can reuse these. So I record it on Camtasia and I upload them to YouTube. Uh, you could put it on, you know, uh, the media gallery in Canvas too. Um, so uh, that, that is important in terms of content. So uh, that was a quick look at, um, you know, a learner uh, instructor content. And I would like to hear from you, what are the types of um, uh, content do you guys, what are the types of interaction you do in terms of learner content? And I'm actually going to show you some data. I thought if I had time, I'll, I'll show you some tables. Wait a minute. So, you know, and this happened the last time after I um, did this workshop. So the last couple of times I've done this workshop, I've gone ahead and collected some survey data. It's been interesting. And um, I did this with students, uh, so I'll give a quick look. I shared a few strategies with you, um, but um, uh, so we created an instrument. I think if any of you are interested in looking at the real data, this study should come out soon. It's under revise and resubmit an online learning um, uh, journal. Um, and uh, what we did was uh, we came up with a longer list of engagement strategies, um, but in the MOOS framework, um, um, I think at least 10 strategies. I want to say 27. Um, and these are the ones that are really highly rated. Um, we said we had about 155 students respond to it, and we asked them which of the strategies strategies they thought really, you know, um, engaged them uh, in the course. Um, yes, yes, Sam, I'm going to come back to the comments in a minute. Um, so introducing themselves using an icebreaker discussion, students really valued that. They thought that was very important for learner-learner interaction. Working collaboratively using communi online communication tools, they thought that was important. Interacting through student presentations asynchronously or synchronously. The asynchronously is like, you know, they could record their presentations and still share it. So that was rated high. Um, having choices and selection of readings that drive discussion group formation. They liked that and even peer reviewing class mix work. So, you know, it was on a scale of one to five. Five is very important. So, you know, you see that. So uh, this is learner learner. So when you compare learner learner to learner instructor, learner instructor the ratings are even more higher. Um, so here are some of the top ones that came. Sending regular announcements, they thought that was very important um, to hear from the instructor. Posting grading rubrics for all assignments, creating a forum for students to contact the instructor with questions about the course. Posting a due date checklist at the end of each instructional unit. Um, referring to students by name in the discussion forum that came up high. You know, Elizabeth just mentioned it. Um, and then creating a course orientation for students. They thought that really helped them engage with the instructor too. We have the last one, learner content. Um, they talked about, uh, you know, working on realistic scenarios, like case studies, reports, research papers. Um, they they like that. Um, discussions are uh, when discussions are structured with guiding questions that deepen the understanding of the content. Then they said, you know, that uh, enhances, uh, you know, the learner content interaction. And also when they interact with content in more than one format, they like that. Use of optional resources to explore topics in more depth. I don't do that enough. I think I should. Um, you know, I make everything required. Uh, Quality Matters actually likes to see whether you have optional stuff in there or not. Uh, it's one of the standards. Um, students have an opportunity to reflect on important elements of the course. So that's the other one. So this is like, you know, a little bit more list um, uh, from based on student perception. And I'm actually collecting data right now on faculty perception. So what do faculty think are important strategies that engage, you know, uh, the learners? And um, then, you know, we can see the comparison between student perception and faculty perception. Uh, and one final set of data to leave you with, uh, you know, some of the three categories, of course, learner to instructor interaction came up really high in terms of the means, look at it. So learner to interact, instructor was 4.15, learner content was 3.99, and then learner to learner was at 3.63. So, uh, 
Um, we also had some open-ended questions. We asked them about other strategies, but I'm not going to um, get into that. Um, let's look at um, you know what comments came uh, came from uh, our attendees. Okay, um, Herman Smith. Okay, says uh, set up groups in Canvas and have small groups work on a project. Yes, that is very nice. Um, then Elizabeth says, uh, recorded tutorials of how to code or use software. Yes, that's very important too. Like demonstrations, right? Yeah. Um, screencasting to show. Yeah, those are, they, those are great strategies. When, especially if you take the time to do that, you know, they totally appreciate that. Okay. Um, so um, any, anything else? I know it was quick. Uh, and, uh, we started at 2.15 and it's only 2.46 and I walked you through some of the strategies and um, I also showed you um, some data even. Um, any, anything else you would like to share? Since I have you, uh, I will quickly take you into Canvas. Since I already have my desktop share. <laughs> uh, Okay, so this is the course I wanted to show you. Okay, so there's a quick look at one of my courses um, um, and some of the strategies. I wanted to show you how I do the consistent format and the modules. So this is my home page. Let me quickly walk you through the home page too. Um, so I create these icons. I just, you know, use different colors for different courses. So I do a course overview about the instructor. A syllabus schedule, I do a getting started module, which I call it as week zero, course modules, the different forums and student resources. So I'll show you the getting started module and the course module. So getting started module, I have a lot of documents for them to go through, you know, the syllabus schedule, books, grading policy, the project. But then there's also activities for them to complete, which involves the course orientation, which is in Camtasia, are recorded. Um, and then at the end, they take a getting started quest, you know, so they do all this and then they take a quest. Course orientation and there's the introduction discussion by VoiceThread or I gave them the choice of VoiceThread or Animoto this time. So, you know, that's another nice uh, tool to use. Um, and then the sign up of, uh, uh, like for facilitating discussions, you know, I had a screenshot in there and make them do right in like week zero. Um, make them do a readiness survey. I use this out of Chapel Hill, you know, they have readiness survey and it gives them feedback, you know, if they're not ready on something, how can they get ready? And then also to configure their canvas profile. Even like, you know, putting a picture up, simple things, but you know, it makes a difference. Um, so uh, another quick thing I want to show you is one example module. So, uh, you know, if you see, if you look at my module page, I still use the module functionality, but what I've done is I've created pages. So instead of putting all of them here, you know, I, I used to do that, but then, you know, this is a little bit different. I have a page per module, and then for each page, I have all the elements in there now. So objectives, aligned objectives, and there's the code goal, which takes you back to the goal. Tasks, uh, exactly, you know, what are the different things they have to do. There's the readings, resources. This is my e-lesson, you know, let me click on it. So I can actually maximize it if you want to see. So, so like you know, I would say 10, maximum 15 minutes. I shoot for 10 minutes when I record these. And then there's the discussion. Some weeks there's an assignment, some weeks there's not. And then finally the reflection. And if you look at it, each week is the same. So, you know, I stay with the same consistent format. And, um, and that helps the students. And then going back to home again, I'll show you quickly the forums that I do because this is part of the interaction too. So this is the announcement forum I mentioned. You know, um, anytime I put an announcement, it goes there. Contact the instructor forum uh, if they want to talk to me uh, or like any general question. Um, and student lounge, and this is where the discussion forum summaries um, um, the facilitators post. So uh, that is a quick look, you know, um, 250. I would love to take questions. Um, you know, um, I hope uh, this was beneficial to you and I hope it was worth the wait. Um, and if there's anything, you know, I can help with in your uh, online teaching uh, endeavor, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm, I'm, I'm House of the College of Education. Any questions?
or any thoughts? Are there, and if there are any topics, you know, when you complete your feedback survey, if there are any topics that you would like for workshops to be offered on in the area of uh, teaching online, you can uh, post that too. Or you can also type it in the chat window. Uh, we have done workshops on interaction. We've done workshops on instructor presence. Um, we've done workshop on, we did best practices. Uh, what was about? We also did one on time management. So these are the four we did this year. Uh, but, you know, if you continue to do this and if there's um, anything else you'd like to hear us do a webinar on, we'd be glad to. And um, if you have not had a chance to attend any of the previous workshops, um, they are actually recorded. Uh, so you should be able to find the links uh, through the CTL, CTL website. Okay? No questions? Okay, excellent. Okay, Sam? We can go ahead. Okay, well, thank you so much, Florence, for your excellent uh, presentation and series. We really appreciate it. Um, I would just like to quickly highlight some of our upcoming webinars that we're having. So next, uh, the day after tomorrow, um, we're having one on designing beautiful course navigation buttons. So if you're interested in using a kind of table format, maybe on your home page like uh, Florence did, and you want to design your own buttons, come on uh, Thursday to that webinar. Um, next week, we have um, another in our series uh, from Students Pathway to Success, a faculty guide. This is an e-book that um, our top 40 academy faculty created a year and a half ago. And this time, they'll be talking about the chapter, Learning How to Learn. And then finally, on the 29th, we have um, another professor talking on research-based best practices and online cooperative learning. So if you want to learn a lot about group collaboration in the online environment, please sign up for that webinar as well. And then finally, since we're here, the middle of the afternoon, and you are all so very patient, I want to offer everybody a virtual treat, a virtual dessert, before we finally wrap up this presentation. So please go ahead and enjoy your uh, virtual dessert. And I would just like to thank you again for um, attending this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you at other webinars or maybe even at some of our workshops. So thanks again.